All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Move, Think, Think, the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought, brought to you, you by MyCan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. Chances are this might be the first thing people are listening to in 2024. Maybe. So we better make this a good episode. Seriously. It so better be good. It better be good. And I think we've achieved that. Totally. Because it's the basis for something that I think is included in a lot of people's resolutions. Yeah. Should we just reveal? Drum roll. Probably people know. Social connection. Social connection is what we're talking about today. We're talking about that on a health and wellness podcast because we learned sort of recently how connecting with others has direct effects on our health and wellness. The big stat everyone talked about last year was that social connection can affect your health as much as the decision to smoke or not to smoke. Like, that's a big deal. Regular feelings of loneliness is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. More and more doctors are actually prescribing social connection as a way to improve people's lives. So it's up there with exercise. It's up there with eating, you know, following a Mediterranean diet or some other healthy diet. It's up there with being proactive about your health care, you know, getting your screening, listening to your doctor, maintaining yeah. a healthy weight. All of this stuff, we're adding social connection on that list. And so how do you do it? That's what we're going to be exploring in today's episode. I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm Chris Shulgin. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think. So the world is coming around to this idea, the importance of social connection, and so is Canada. We have a really packed episode for you today. We have Mind Station team lead Jennifer Baldishin. First, she's talking to Pete Bombacci. He's the CEO and the founder of the Genwell Project, which is a Canadian organization that's working to get all of us more connected in some really cool ways. Then we'll be hearing about Canada's social connection guidelines from Dr. Kiffer Card. He's a social epidemiologist from Simon Fraser University. Canada's social connection guidelines are still in development, but Dr. Kiffer Card gave me a sneak peek of what they currently are as they're drafted. And I don't think you'll be able to hear this stuff anywhere else. So that's an exclusive for you think that's exciting finally in this packed episode about social connection we have jennifer baldish in chatting with sociology professors margaret m chin and syed ali who recently wrote a book called the pure effect yeah they'll be talking about the ways that your peers and your culture really affect who you are whether you realize it or not and so that's helpful to think about when you're setting out to create more social connections this year okay well look this sounds like a great episode for the first of the year and let's get right to it here's jennifer baldish in talking to people on batch Hi, Pete. Welcome to Eat, Move, Think. How are you? I'm wonderful, Jennifer. How are you? I'm good, thanks. It's so nice that we're able to have this conversation today. You're a real visionary when it comes to this because we're all playing catch up. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. I spent 20 years in the beverage alcohol industry. And what I recognized is that people were happiest when they were with other people. So a lot of the things that have happened in my life led to it. But really, you know, it was uh, the blackout of 2003 that really catalyzed, hey, we need to stop waiting until the crisis before we start talking to the people that we walk by each and every day. I saw the beauty of the human species right after the, the, the power went out. We saw people directing traffic and handing out water and picking up people on street corners, which, as we know, in Toronto, that never happens anymore. And I thought to myself, that's crazy. Why is it that it takes a pan like a pandemic or a blackout or a snowstorm or an ice storm or whatever crisis for us to actually talk to the people that we work beside, live beside, go to school beside? And so that was really the catalyst behind, you know, creating these catalytic occasions on our Genwell weekends and more importantly, educating people about the importance of social connection and social health to their overall well-being. So tell me a little more about the Genwell project. Yeah, so ultimately what we are is we are a, a movement. We're Canada's human connection movement. And we're trying to educate 40 million Canadians about this information. We share tips, tools, ideas, research, and motivation every day. And we have for seven years. Everything we do is all about behavior change. Because I, if you don't know the information, I can't get you to consider it. If I can get you to consider it and give you the tools and show you how easy, then I might be able to get you to do it yourself. 
Our point is, if I can give you information, I can show you that friends, family, neighbors, classmates, colleagues, strangers, and I can give you opportunities throughout the course of the year and help you understand that all of those connections can add value to your life and make you feel a greater sense of connection and belonging, then I believe over time we can change this world by giving people that understanding that human connection is an important part of their mental and physical well-being. So tell me a little bit about how what you've learned with your research about how being isolated or lonely can impact our physical health. I'm going to say a couple of things. First off, I think it's really important for us to understand what loneliness is. And so I think for a lot of people, uh, because we've never educated on loneliness, I believe we think loneliness is about being alone. But the other part of loneliness, which is a lack of belonging, is the real wake up call, I think, for the broader population. And lonely is not a mental health issue. Lonely is the body and the brain letting us know that we need human connection. And so if we can educate people, then loneliness is nothing to fear. But what we need to make sure that people understand, okay, when you feel that sense of loneliness or disconnection from other people, here's 10 ways in which you can start making those connections happen. So you could go over to your local coffee shop. You could go for a walk with your dog in the dog park. You could call up an old friend. You could call up a new friend. You could talk to a neighbor. You know, and our research in Canada shows those who talk to neighbors are three times less lonely. People who talk to strangers are three times happier than those that don't talk to strangers. But I think to your question, which was, what are the negative consequences? Well, uh, social isolation, disconnection, and loneliness is a link, link to heart disease, doubles your risk of diabetes, early onset of dementia, anxiety and depression, uh, suicide, obesity, addiction. You know, really, when we talk about the inflammation created in the body when we feel stressed, which is a result of feeling lonely, disconnected, isolated from other people, it really leads to all illnesses. Creating a more connected society can only reduce the cost that our healthcare system faces, uh, because as we build connection, whether it's for you or for me, one of us is likely going to be better, if not both of us. Well, it's true that when we have stress, if it's mental stress or physical stress, our brains are always programmed to protect us. Like our brains cannot differentiate different kinds of stress in the world. Our brain just says, you seem to be a bit stressed. I'll protect you. So you have all these hormonal and physical changes inside your body that will help lead you to either fight, run away, or hide to help you do something to get to safety. So I think it's because of those hormonal and physical changes that can then lead to all these other physical ailments. Your sympathetic nervous system gets triggered and your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your muscles get tight, you stop digesting your food, your blood coagulates, and all this is going to help save your life if you're under attack. But like you said, if you don't have anybody to decompress with, anybody to debrief at the end of the day what your day was like, that can make those physical changes that can then lead to all of these physical ailments you said. Yeah, I think we're all trying to avoid chronic or persistent loneliness. I don't know if you're familiar with the study that came out during the global pandemic. It was out of Boston University saying that social connection is the single greatest preventative action that we can take to avoid depression. And maybe what we're all seeking here is a greater resilience to say, hey, if stuff happens, which it's going to happen, that's life, that we can we can overcome it because we know we have people in our corner. We know we have people behind us. And whether that's uh, a job loss, a divorce, uh, the loss of a loved one. Um, you know, think of the list of the 400 things that can happen to an individual in the course of their life. And every one of those can lead to that sense of isolation and loneliness. And if we can raise that level of consciousness and intentionality that you spoke about, you know, I think we can help people cope a little bit better with some of the struggles that we might face, you know, in this thing we call life. And not even just sharing the negative stuff. We want to share the positive stuff too. For sure. You know? Yeah. So why is it that when we go to the doctor, the doctors ask us about sleep, exercise, alcohol, but they don't ask, how are the connections in your life? Why do you think that is? Well, I have seen it repeatedly. I've seen Julianne Holt Lundstadt do podcasts with people who, uh, you know, as medical doctors say, Nobody ever told me this. 
In MBA programs, they weren't talking about empathy and compassion and connection as a means to driving successful businesses. So I think really, Jennifer, it comes back to the fact that we've never educated anyone on this information. And now we're trying to catch up after a global pandemic. Do you think there's newer research that's coming out now than, say, 10 or 15 years ago? I don't think the new research, there's certainly new research. We've done three years of the Canadian Social Connection Survey, but most of it's just reinforcing what was already known. The work of Julianne Holt Lundstadt, John Cassiopo, which is really late 90s. You know, this information has been around for 30 to 40 years. So I think we took our social connections slightly for granted. And now we've woken up on the other side of the pandemic and we joke about beauty sleep. Well, we need to talk about social connection in that same light where it's like, look, if I don't get my social connection in, I'm not going to be feeling good tomorrow. I, I've noticed this, you know, being a social worker here at MedCan, you know, people used to be more socially active before the pandemic. And then with the pandemic, they lost some of that and they're finding it difficult to re-engage. How do you help somebody get over the nerves that come with socializing? How do they step out of their comfort zone, even if intellectually they know that they should be connected? The follow-up question to that is that as adults, it's really hard to broaden their social network. With little kids, they run into the playground, they come running back after five minutes and they go, mommy, I just made a new best friend. And with adults who are busy, they don't have a lot of extra time to give to their social network. They might only be able to make a quick phone call. You're saying that we need the human connection face to face and getting out there and getting out into nature, getting out in, out in the, the real world. How do you do that as an adult? Yeah, I think these are some really, really great questions, Jennifer. And I think we need to recognize that people are all across the spectrum. There are people that are jumping back in. They can't wait to get back to it. And yet there's other people who have shifted their way down. Certainly when communities and organizations try to get people together, it's always, how can we solve the problem with everybody at one time? And that's not the solution we need right now. We need to find programs. We have we have programs that we work on. We do a lot of work in workplaces right now. And in the catalyzing of human connection, we think about individuals, we think about teams, and we think about organizations and finding that mix so that every person in the organization finds their way to build connections so that they may, some people may never get away from the one-on-one -on -one conversation, but hopefully over time we can progress where they feel comfortable because when we feel connected to people that are in other departments and other uh, cultures and other experiences, we can grow as human beings. Now, there's a study out of the U.S. that said 76% of employees pre-pandemic found it difficult to build connections with other people in the workplace. So what we need to recognize as business leaders, you can no longer leave it to the employees to do it. You need to do it. It increased productivity, trust, optimism, collaboration, innovation. All of these things are all uh, fact-based research, you know, from the, the best schools and researchers. This is good business. I think it's really important to look at how you're flipping the narrative. It's not about the social connection, how it will improve your life, the person in front of you me. It's about looking at all the other people that that person is interacting with. So if I go to the checkout person at the grocery store and say, wow, you seem tired. Have you had a long shift today? Or what time do you get off break? You know, what was your day like? Right away, they smile and they're interacting because everybody else is pushing their groceries through, frowning, like looking at their watch. What you're saying is social connection. It's not just about you getting outside, living your life, not being on technology, but it's about acknowledging the other person and everybody kind of waking up a little bit. Well, Jennifer, I couldn't have said it better myself. And I'm almost emotional, honestly, listening to you feed that back. You know, I think if we can all just raise that collective consciousness of the impact that a word, an acknowledgement, a wave, a smile can have. And I truly do believe this. And maybe, maybe I am crazy, Jennifer, but I feel like you're part of the crazy team now. 
which is I believe we can change the world because if every one of us took one more action every day, I believe we can make the world a happier and healthier place for everyone. I almost feel like that's where we should leave it for today. That was just such a good summary of everything we've been talking about today. Thank you so much for being on Eat, Move, Think, Pete. This has been a great chat. Stay well, everyone. Now we'll be hearing from Dr. Kiffer Card, Assistant Professor at Simon Fraser University and Research Director of Canada's Social Connection Guidelines. Think about what it means to live in modern society and relative to where humanity has spent the vast majority of our life and our evolution. We used to live in really small tribes of about 150 people. And now we live in big sprawling cities. And ironically, even though we're surrounded by people more than ever and more connected through digital technologies, we're actually experiencing more emotional distress from loneliness than probably ever before throughout all of human history. And so this is where the idea of social connection guidelines actually begins. It's a recognition that humans have a natural state in which they are connected and they have certain relational and social needs fulfilled. So, um, you know, with any new guidelines, if you can imagine maybe, you know, 40 years ago or, you know, when they're developing food and exercise guidelines, people knew, okay, they know exercise is important, but they don't know necessarily how much important. And so it's a little bit as much of an art as it is a science. And so you'd be surprised at how little of the academic literature actually addresses these fundamental questions of, you know, what do I need to be socially healthy? And um, so our first effort is to really understand what is in the literature now. And so we're conducting 40 or 50 scoping reviews. Um, You know, this has all been supported by in partnership with the Public Health Agency of Canada and with leading researchers across the uh, across the country and funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research, this like massive scoping review series. And we've recruited about 120 of the world's leading experts on social connection isolation to participate in our consultation. And so now we're going back and forth over the wording and language and the evidence underlying those 12 guidelines. And so we're pretty close and we expect probably to have guidelines launched sometime next year. I think when we set out to first develop the guidelines, we we thought in ignorance partially is we're like, we could tell somebody that if you get an hour of social connection a day, and if you get, you know, four to six friends, And you spend most of your time with those people who really uplift you and give you strong sense of belonging and feeling that that would be what the guidelines would look like. And of course, uh, when we've actually started to open up the literature and see what is the evidence base and then what do experts say, it's been a real challenge to develop guidelines that will work for everyone, if that makes sense, because everybody's social situation is different. Everybody's social needs are slightly different. And so is what we've ended up with guidelines is really an invitation for people to analyze to some extent what's going on in their life and some decision guides or some advice or information that would help them to make those sort of decisions um, for themselves. When they're released, there'll be a total of 12 social connection guidelines, six for individuals and six for communities. And Dr. Kivercard was kind enough to read us the six for individuals as they're currently written. So our guidelines for individuals Number one, at least as it's currently drafted, you know, these might change, but it's make social connection a priority. You know, that simple reminder that you need to be thinking about this, just like, you know, I like try to eat a healthy diet and I try to exercise three times a week. Like those are like priorities in my life that like I make time for them. And I think in the same way, I need to think about, you know, am I getting the social connection that they need? The second one that we have is just cultivate a positive outlook on yourself and outlook on your social world. Because I find a lot of loneliness, a lot of isolation comes from not having a good sense of self and believing in yourself, believing that other people will like you. And so really fostering that sense of self is is number two. Number three is build a strong social network. So instead of saying that's four, you know, I think the evidence just say like, we cannot rely on just one person. So if you're a person that like me and my partner, we are joined at the hips. We like both work from home. We like spend a lot of our lives together and it's great. But I think reminding you that your your one partner probably isn't going to cut it, that when times get rough, you know, partners get sick or they pass away, all those sort of things happen throughout the life course. You actually need something more robust than that. And so, um, you know, having a, a broader social network so you always have somebody to turn to for support. 
Um, getting enough social connection is what we say. And what we really think that means is that you probably need some sort of daily social interaction. You need to see another human being. You need to interact with another human being. And that doesn't mean every day, but like most days, you should probably be out there. And then probably on a weekly basis, somewhat, you probably need to have a more in-depth like form of connection with somebody so that you're always keeping fresh that connection. So that's what we think of getting enough social connection means. And then spending that social energy where it counts, right? Investing in those relationships that are really beneficial to you. Um, then we just have two more, develop new relationships and deepen the ones you have. I love the saying that you can't make an old friend, right? It's like, we need to focus on those people we already know, those connections, our family, and make sure that we keep those alive and healthy. And deepening those relationships is how you do that. So don't let your relationships just be surface level, like go deeper, find belonging in the people you live with and, and live around. And then the last one is just be smart about how you use technology, right? I think a lot of us will sit there and scroll on our phones and we'll waste all that precious time that we could be connecting with the other person next to us in bed. We could be, you know, calling somebody, you know, so make sure that you're using in technology in a way that benefits your social life, not detracts from it. And that means, especially when you're interacting with somebody face to face, don't sit on your phone and, you know, just interact with your phone. Like take the time of that precious opportunity to have somebody in front of you. And so those are the guidelines for individuals. Like a lot of it might come off as common, common sense, which, but that's good. I think that's what we're really there to remind people that what is common sense, that internal drive, that internal yearning for connection. That is an evolutionary response. And so if a lot of these things seem to resonate with you, with you as just kind of being, oh, yeah, that's obvious. You know, I think that's why. And how does in-person social connection compare to virtual connection? If you ask like the average person, I think they'd tell you, of course, it's better to be face to face with somebody. And a lot of that's just because like they say that body language, right? I don't know. I don't know what the saying is. It's it's probably not scientifically based, but you know, they say something like nine tenths of communication is is body language and movement. But there's actually things that are just touch and feel. We actually see that people have more interpersonal touch, even just like a pat on the arm, a hug, you know, those sort of things are actually really beneficial to people. There's something in our central nervous system that yearns to be in physical contact with other people. And so that is actually a pretty validated part of research. Now, that doesn't mean that there's never a time for uh, digital interaction because the way we've structured our society, I haven't, you know, I haven't lived near my family since I was 18, really. And if it weren't for digital communications, I wouldn't really have any connection to them. And so I think there's a place for these sort of interactions, but they can't come at the expense of our in-person connections because something about us as biological beings does require that face-to-face -face connection. And we've seen that, you know, if you look at like workplace cohesion, we did a study that showed that if you're completely digital, um, that you're not as well off as if you're a hybrid, that something about hybrid work, because we need those interactions that can't be facilitated via a series of one hour meetings all day long, right? There, there's a lot of stuff missed that is just natural human stuff. And um, and so, yeah, so I think that digital piece is, is something that we really really learned a lot more about over the past few years. Really, you need to not let technology interfere with your so with your social life, you know, to make sure that you are prioritizing that in-person face-to-face connection and to use uh, social media in particular actively, you know, active engagement with people, not passively. Um, so scrolling TikTok or Instagram, that's passive use. Active use is like, hey, isn't this meme great? Or hey, what are you doing this weekend? We should go grab a bite to eat. Like that's active use. That's using it in a way that is actually building your social life. And so that's what we're telling people to do is like use it as a tool to get you into that in-person face-to-face connection that you need. And now here's Jennifer Baldishin chatting with Margaret M. Chin and Syed Ali, the authors of The Deer Effect. Hi, welcome to the podcast for Eat, Move, Think. Margaret and Syed, it's so nice meeting you. So the peer effect looks largely at the people and the culture that we're surrounded by. Can you break down exactly what culture is, the concept, and why we're talking about it today on a podcast specifically about health and wellness? Cultures are tied into groups and to people. So they're very specific to those, to those groups and inherent to those groups. And the idea of culture is, it's not the stuff, right? So, I mean, like anthropologists look at culture and it's like, dress and music and food, but those things change really culture is about the kind of ground rules for how to, how to behave in the group, the do's and don'ts, the, the social norms. And you can tell what's important to a people by the 
the norms that they have that are most central. And when we're talking about peer cultures, we're talking about horizontal cultures, right? So it's like, what are the norms that the groups themselves make? Another concept you brought up was a concept of cultural capital. And I really love that that idea, that term. Can you explain that a little bit about what you meant by cultural capital? With cultural capital, I think different people have access to different kinds of networks around them, or even have access, um, depending on how uh, wealthy one can be, you may have access to different clubs or different neighborhood. But in social capital, what we're talking about is that because Syed and I, or me in particular, you know, we came from a, a background where we were able to hang out or be with friends of different class backgrounds who had access to different things. So for me, I never had lunch or dinner in a fancy restaurant until I went to Syverson High School. And it was because my classmates parents took us out and I went with them. I'm a working class kid. I grew up in the projects in the Upper West Side in New York City. So in my world, my father was a waiter. My mother was a garment worker. And if we went out to eat or anything, it meant that we went to Chinatown. So my first introduction was to going to a fancier restaurant and meeting people and talking about going to college. It opened doors to you. It gave you ideas you hadn't thought of before. And another thing you said in the book is that there's some kids who wouldn't know that you could knock on your teacher's door and utilize those office hours. And the people who came from a background where they had tutoring or they had schooling that allowed them to do extracurriculars, that was something that you could learn from others that would then therefore make you more successful because you'd surround yourself with people who had other opportunities that you may not have had. Absolutely. So that was part of being among this peer group. So I think it makes a huge difference by having peers and having a culture that actually reinforces this information. Another thing about cultural capital, another way to think about it, is it's like learning the unwritten rules of the of the game, right? So it's not material culture, but it's it's knowledge that you wouldn't necessarily have access to. It's not something you can you can Google. Right, it's something that you found find out. You've mentioned in the book that there's such a strong correlation to uh, childhood development and those childhood friendships. Do they continue as adults? And can we still grow and change as adults with the communities that we put ourselves in now? Or do you see that more as a developmental growth, more for children? Peer effects are rooted in peer groups. As we get older, we change peer groups. Some people have fewer peer groups. They have less friends. Other people, you know, add peer groups and have, you know, kind of thriving lives. So who we are is still very much shaped by the kinds of peers that we, that we keep. So yeah, we're not like we are at 16, but we are, we're, we're, we can still change right into our fifties and and sixties, seventies. Yeah. On. I mean, I think about I think about like uh, retirement communities. They play golf, they play tennis, they they go to the pool, they see the same people, and they affect each other's behavior. They affect each other's beliefs, and you know, the a lot of them become healthier too, right? So, I mean, this is a health and wellness kind of podcast, and they like my my in laws when they left, you know, suburban Chicago and moved down to moved down to Florida to the villages. They lost weight. They got, you know, much healthier. My father-in-law had like a quadruple bypass surgery and the stent was only supposed to last like 10 years. And like he lived like a good 30 years beyond 25 years beyond his, uh, beyond the surgery. So the, so, you know, who your peers are, even into your seventies and eighties is going to have a tremendous effect upon, upon your behavior. That's a really good point. If we have people around us who open that door to showing us what's possible, you know, like the healthy lifestyle, um, eating, exercise, sleep, all of that, then it opens the door to the realm of possibilities. And then we are more likely to engage in that behavior. If people are into being healthier, they also check on each other too. 
So these are the things that I think even in a community among married couples, let's say, or kids who go to the gym or whatever, it actually helps to have that kind, be surrounded by the people who you want to be like. It's a good segue into looking at workplace culture. In the book, you were saying that diversity training does not work. You know, if we want to affect change within our workplace, can you tell the audience who's listening today, talk a little bit more about how we can have some sort of positive influence at work. Talk a little bit about what you're saying about why diversity training does not work and maybe about what potentially could help to create the culture that we want in our workplace. Yeah, so um, in our book, we, we talk a lot about the studies in uh, diversity training and we, we, we cite um, Frank Dobbin and Alexandra Kalev and their work that they do because they study thousands of um, corporations and thousands of studies. And what they found was that there's a one particular process that we're all using and doing right now that doesn't seem to work that well. And that's um, implicit bias training and diversity training. And part of it is that you could teach people about the biases that they have, but it doesn't always mean that they can change it because it means that everybody among that whole group has to change their view on it and need to make policies that will affect change. So what we learned is from their study and actually from some of the work that I do in interviewing people, that it's much better to actually bring in people who, if we're talking about diversity, racial diversity, bring in people of different racial groups. And that's the easiest way because it changes the group membership of your peers. Because if you think about it, we are more diverse even within our racial group. If you bring in people, let's say 10 people who are Black, 10 people who are Asian American, 10 people who are Latino, you'll learn that even among those 30 new people you bring in, they all have different views, but they also bring in additional things that they may know about their community that can help the corporation. And that's when people begin to learn that diversity matters. And that's the best way to actually, um, let's say, have a more diverse workplace and to actually change the thinking inside of the workplace. It's a slow process by just slowly hiring the right people. What would you say for our listeners? What are some key concepts that they can take away from the pure effect to better themselves? So the basic idea of the book in a nutshell is who you hang out with affects who you become. And indirectly, the group setting that you're in is going to have its its own culture, its own way of its own way of doing things. And if you feel like you're stuck or you're unhealthy, you know, mentally, physically, that the people around you are not kind of helping you be, you know, the best that you can be, change your peers or get new peer groups, right? Like find new things to do, find new activities with with other people, right? And, you know, you don't necessarily have to completely reject the peers that you that you have, but you're developing new peer associations. So then you have these kind of competing norms and competing groups where you don't have to do all the things that those people do. And having, you know, just having more friends and more different social settings is, you know, it's better for health in general, mental health anyway. So if your peers aren't allowing you to feel true to yourself, then you can look for another peer group, just as I had said, additional peer groups, additional groups that may make you yourself Uh, feel better and make you know that you're being true to yourself. That allows you to be healthier as well. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and sharing your book. No, thank you so much. This is so much fun. Thanks, Jen. That was MedCan's Mind Station lead, Jennifer Baldishin, in conversation with Pure Effect authors Margaret M. Chin and Syed Ali. And earlier we heard from Dr. Kiffer Card. He is a social epidemiologist at Simon Fraser University. And to start the episode, we heard Genwell Project founder Pete Bombacci talking about the importance of social connection. To learn more about the Mind Station or book a consultation, you can email clientservice at medcan.com or call 416-350-5900. 
Follow Medkin on Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to us on YouTube at Medkin Live Well. We'll post episode highlights and other links that you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat, Move, Think is produced by Ghost Bureau, Jasmine Ratch is managing producer, social media and strategy support is from Chantal Gertz and Andrew Imex and Elaine Genest. And executive producer is Christopher Shulgin. We'll be back soon with another episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.